So I think we should uh, get started if we, if we could, please. If you could find a seat. Um, and could I just remind you, please turn off your phones so we don't get uh, phone calls through the, through the lecture. Um, we're very lucky this evening to have Eric Perry back in the AA talking to us. Uh, many of you will know Eric, of course, past president of the AA. Uh, and with a long history of teaching in Cambridge, in GSD, in Harvard, in, in Tokyo. Um, and 30 years ago now, started a practice. It is 30 years, isn't it, almost? Almost 30 years ago. Sorry, it makes him sound like a very old man. Uh, quite a long time ago, uh, <laughs> Eric set up uh, his practice, Eric Perry, and uh, we're going to see a bit of the work today. Uh, one of the really impressive things about the work of the practice is the extraordinary attention to the quality of design within co very complex urban conditions. He's called his lecture Architecture and the Politics of Urban Renewal. Uh, and it's very much about uh, the issues that we in the Housing and Urbanism Programme are dealing with all the time. We've just finished our whole day of reviews of the MArch final projects, all of them in different ways, dealing exactly with that, the politics of urban renewal and the role of architecture, the role of spatial thinking in processes which are highly complex economic, political and social processes, uh, and what the architect can bring to that in unlocking the potential uh, and the productivity of a whole range of urban conditions, whether you're in the middle of London or, as we have been this afternoon, in the middle of Mumbai or in the middle of uh, Shenzhen in China. Uh, so uh, Eric's going to reflect through a series of projects from the office uh, on this question of architecture and the politics of urban renewal. Thank you, Julia. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to lose sight of, uh, of either kind of end, actually, uh, if I can do so. That is to say that the world of aesthetics and the world of uh, um, bald economics, on the other hand, and uh, the, the impetus for change, um, which is often simply the fact that spaces are worn out and kind of need uh, regenerating. So... <coughs> I think, in a nutshell, that's the uh, the, the tightrope that one uh, works with as an architect. Um, but before I launch into that, there are certain premises that I think are very important, uh, many of which I, I learned here as a student um, in the late 80s. So I passed through here in a relatively speedy year, but um, uh, it was an, a, an extraordinary time about the discussion of what the city is and meant um, and uh, I was in a unit run by Dalibor Vaisley, uh, Moisan Mustafavi and Peter Carl um, in particular. Uh, really <coughs> focused on the kind of European city in a way in that tradition of continuity. Um, and so it is that, that all the projects in a way fit into a uh, existing contexts are the ones I'm showing tonight um, and um, are responsive, I hope, to that context. This is um, by way of just introduction at a college in Cambridge, which was uh, an early, early-ish project, um, just showing the evolution of the project and the fact that you know, one of the, one of the uh, most resilient parts of a city are the streets. Um, even more so, ironically, now, of course, as they get filled with services, they don't, they don't change that sort of sense of the street, um, of, a, uh, of, of an edge, which is very important and I think incredibly valuable as something that's um, ever-present. This is a, a, you can see, this is 650 years um, of, of development of one college, Pembroke College in Cambridge. Um, to which we added a, uh, a court, an unfinished court, um, called now by them Foundress Court, um, and it replaced uh, a, a, a on a site one one lodge, one uh, the 
Principals Lodge of the college, with 100 uni student uni uh, rooms and a new lodge and many other things. But the point about it was, um, th this is first sort of sketches, it's a negotiation with the street pattern, it's a negotiation with this history of the interior, it's a negotiation with what a student room would be on the inside and what that manifests on the outside. Um, and to me, the thing that I took away from this, I still go back occasionally to have a look at failures and successes in terms of the detailing, but um, is, is the fact that it had 17 elevations. So it wasn't, as it were, a, a, a single building uh, in a way. It was a, a, a building wrapped around a set of spaces, the biggest one of which was this. Um, uh, and in taking that sort of sense of the edge and the preciousness of the edge, um, the, the, there are uh, four projects that I'm going to show. Um, and I'm, I'm going to mix some of the constraints, um, obviously, of <coughs> development and, and what made them a necessity. And the first is this project for St. Martin in the Fields, which was in a kind of hopeless state, which I'll show you, but I'm going to show you where we got to in a way. Um, and what's interesting is the, as I, I say, is a sort of palimpsest of, of others who've worked on the site. So the, the church is finished in 1724 by James Gibbs, and it was locked into the landscape of red roof tiles, uh, unseen in terms of uh, its body, its white Portland stone body, bar the portico, which you would have seen from St. Martin's Lane, and the spire, which you can see is sort of extruded out of the building which you uh, would see from afar. And now what we see of this element as the hinterland to Trafalgar Square and all that that means um, is a building that has um, uh, opened up, was opened up by John Nash. So this, uh, in his great processional way from Regent's Park to Carlton House, um, he was very aware of this trajectory, the inflection of the church that you see here. Um, and it built a range of buildings around the church to set it off almost in a landscape sense um, against new buildings. So that was the second uh, negotiation of the site and uh, in, a, in a way uh, ours was the third. But I think what's important to say is that this was bound hugely by issues of heritage um, the, and uh, that some of the participants were extraordinary. I think as one starts, I'm just going to take you through what's there now at the lowest level, a new level, is a light well, um, a new church hall, a chapel, which I'll come back to at the end of this, a, the Chinese uh, center, the Homing Wa center, a, a music rehearsal room, this plant room which deals with air f drawn from the light well. And then we go up a level to, the su that's the most subterranean level, the second basement, a new level as I say. The level above um, it shows you the, the, the territories. The green is called Enterprise, it's where the cafe is, and it generates money, and it generates money to, uh, to feed uh, literally the homeless in the connection, which is the blue area, uh, uh, which is not a hostel, but it's a day center and a, and a night shelter. Um, uh, and the parish and so on, which does a lot of work. Um, and it, it gets that money from selling tickets in the shop and the ticketing area for concerts that happen above this. So there's a sort of an undercroft um, which is uh, very pragmatic in terms of enabling the business plan for the whole site to work. The site is actually interesting. It's about the scale of, uh, of you know, the, in, in the inner dimensions of Leicester Square. It's kind of, it's a big site made of, 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 of these two existing buildings. Um, and it was made to work by a new building that you don't see, which is this 10-foot slot at the back, which into which there are uh, provisions for lifts, access, and, and so on. Um, uh, and then uh, this is the voids of the double height areas. You begin to see what you come down to um, uh, from the level above which is the pavement. So the pavement now has an entrance as Nash intended to a domestic set of rooms and uh, f there are three clergy flats here. It's kind of administrative center in the vestry hall and then the, uh, the center for the connection um, which is en entered from here. This is very much about clarifying 
entrances, actually, architecturally. So um, these entrances, the three, mil three quarter of a million people who, who uh, come to the site a year are, in a secular way, are drawn down to that new world underground. Um, and there's a, there's a churchyard which is a space elevated above, above the street, which is just a place of, uh, of kind of quietude, um, contemplating the, uh, the, the wall of the church um, at its east end. And to make that work, um, the, the, all these railings have been pulled back. There's a new entrance here so that this isn't a cul-de-sac as a space, and so on. So that, that um, not only the parish is involved, but the negotiation with the way and who of ownership and um, uh, of this territory, which becomes much more public in the scheme, was another. Um, and not least with uh, the help of a criminologist from the LSE and the local police force, you know, sort of sense of how this site would be used. So one forgets those discussions which are kind of absolutely vital, out of which, for instance, that set of steps um, emerges. Um, a kind of unseen, unseen force in the process of design um, that then goes up. So we're just seeing the way in which the blue, which is the connection, rises from this side of the site and the residential <coughs> at this end um, and then right up to the top. Um, <coughs> in the end, using the, uh, the spaces up in the attic by breaking out these openings in this wall with our new uh, building there. And it's therefore, it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, there are uh, at least nine groupings that are in involved in, in the building and in a very, very heavy use of the building. Um, and it's the synergy, the sort of, the simultaneity of these parts which makes it a very interesting, uh, almost unseen intervention um, into the landscape because English heritage and Westminster uh, would not countenance uh, another building of any scale above ground. So it's an underground building that's forced by those, by those uh, heritage circumstances, really. Um, in effect, the entire site was grade one listed because the Nash vaults, um, which you'll see in a second, surrounded the building and were part of the process of evolution of this. And so under the, under the auspices of what we have now as the connection to a grade one list listed building being itself of that d uh, designation makes any intervention or change uh, impossible unless you have the co cohesiveness of, of a group um, of people who will uh, are working towards one goal, which is to renew, to destroy, uh, in order to renew and make the site work um, as, as, as a whole. Um, and if you took a myopic view of, say, a railing or a vault, um, the thing could have uh, seized up at any point. But the competition was run in such a way that all the people um, who were perten pertinent to the politics of this scheme were around the table so that after that they couldn't actually back out. Um, so this just gives you the two cross sections um, the crypt, this restaurant set below a wonderful uh, Baroque, English Baroque interior set against um, uh, Nash's uh, kind of theatre uh, stage set architecture but doing a great job. Um, and then the third perspective which is the interventions around this. So um, this is Gibson, the way he saw it in an idealized way because it certainly wasn't surrounded when he was there by um, such uh, organized fabric. His model, which is remarkable, which you may have seen at the v &A, very few changes, but you can, when you walk around this, it's amazing to see, you can imagine this going into that vestry hall um, uh, or the old one, uh, and it describes different uh, details of fenestration and wall uh, detail on one side to the other, and he would have been weighing up the, the pros and cons of that. Uh, the only thing that's really changed is the, is the portico, which is added to in order to make it more evident in uh, St. Uh, St. Martin's Lane. And this is before Nash, actually, so before the mid-19th uh, century, 1840s. Um, it gives you some idea of what that path was 
on the north side of the church. So you, here you have the church and this fabric before Nash gets a hold of it. So you have the first iteration. Extraordinary to see this uh, building dropped into the scale of, uh, of the urban structure. No Trafalgar Square, of course, so there's a kind of barracks here, stables building by Kent, um, and, and a tight lane leading down to Charing Cross. Um, and this was uh, Gibbs's first scheme, actually, which was too big for the site, and he was sent back to the drawing board, but contains the, the seeds of a number of the parts of the building uh, that you uh, that now find. But, and I think, actually, interestingly, we talk about the politics of, of those, of heritage, those voices now, but actually, when you start as an architect as a kind of in, in innocent, um, or inspired innocent, perhaps, uh, it would be uh, fair to say, um, but n without a kind of historic knowledge of a site. And ten years later, you end up with a kind of strange closeness to these architects of Gibbs and Nash because you go in and you understand bit by bit what the the architecture is saying to you about their own kind of um, their own kind of uh, struggles uh, just curiously this was a part of my that year at the AA cemetery at St Giles so this is the Flitcroft uh, steeple casting its shadow on a columbarium structure um, that I designed um, and it, it's it to me, strange how that sort of haunts that business of the subterranean and the, the, even the geometry, if you will. Um, but during this process, another uh, p constituent part of the reality is, uh, are the archaeologists. There are parts of the site that were uh, un, uh, not disturbed by Nash, and that included this wonderful sarcophagus, which is a Roman sarcophagus. Uh, you can see somebody's decapitated this with some um, bit of uh, foundation work later on. But the, 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 the skeleton is a fourth century skeleton, um, uh, sort of uh, to the time that the Romans were about to leave the country. So, so this discovery through uh, the sacred nature of this site back another 300 years, and it is interesting to remember it's the way in which London is developed out of the east with the city, um, and the West End along the Strand, which is uh, the German word for beach, um, you know, that it takes this edge uh, at a rising of which you find St. Martin. So um, with a long history, but uh, amazing then to find how precocious and ambitious Nash was. Uh, you can just see all the fabric that he knocked down to create Duncannon Street. This is South Africa House. You know, to the north is his North Range. There's another set of buildings that he makes here um, in order to create this, uh, this moment on, on the great progress from, from the north. Uh, Fox Talbot, uh, a view of Trafalgar Square with the, the column being built. And this is how it was. So the washes of the colors are the same. Um, you had a series of single-storied uh, vaults. Um, they were, as the vicar said, designed for the dead but inhabited by the living. Um, and literally a kind of extraordinary mess, it has to be said, of, of leakages, of difficulties. This is where the homeless would come to sign in or for the day center. There were eight kitchens on this site. Um, there were two care organizations designated by the different blue which, as an architectural issue, uh, the consultation of which is, is, is a key to making the scheme work, because we reduced in totality the area of the blue, but made it work much harder here and up uh, this area than into the roof, and enabled the, uh, the, the two organizations with some difficulty to come together. But this is, for instance, was the green room in which you know, the Academy of St. Martin Fields or any other musicians would come to, um, to change. Um, there were the most extraordinary proximities in things like these, uh, these toilets here where somebody might be shooting up or somebody might be trying to go to a concert. It was, it was, it's, it was very, very tough world um, that was trying to uh, maintain um, a, a kind of evenness just in terms of its fabric to do its job. Um, so you found above was the was the was the market, um, uh, and this is the sort of sequence going into uh, into the uh, underground territory of the connection as it stood. So 
a, um, a, a night shelter, uh, as I say, not a hostel. Um, uh, and the church was still kind of decorated in the, um, in a, the only thing that had been lost was, apart from the beauty of the finishes, was uh, there's the glass, and it had been put back in this sort of, um, in a studio glass in the 50s. Um, and it still had the decoration from the early, very early or very late 19th century paid for by Harrods of, uh, of a sort of polychromy, um, uh, which Gibbs never intended. And an East End uh, designed the sanctuary uh, by an architect uh, called Reginald Blomfield, who sort of shows up everywhere, really. But that set off a fantastic argument between the Victorian society and the Georgian group. Should we send this back, take it back to its original? So this is just a small part, apart from the congregation, the fact that you couldn't really, there are 27 you know, religious services a week, but there are a huge number of concerts, and you needed a capacity, the brief was, to create a space that would work for 8, 80, or 800. Um, so there were a lot of changes to be made. Um, this is the decoration. Um, and uh, this is where it is, or was it a, a few years ago. It, 2008 it, it finished, um, in, a, in a project that then meant, um, you know, when you go into this space, you might say, well, what's happened really, apart from the east window? Uh, incredible amount. I think I take that as a huge compliment, actually, but it was, you know, the, the pulpit is moved across here. The whole of the east end is reordered, um, the redecoration, the resurfacing. This was linoleum, actually, so that's all new uh, uh, Purbeck stone, new Purbeck to the sanctuary, and then Shirazi Hushiari's wonderful, uh, wonderful east window. And one of the issues with a project like this is that, that actually there are a lot of art commissions. So we have an art advisory panel um, that just works with the competitions for art commissioning, uh, of which this was the most significant. But her altar is now in place, which is also very beautiful. Um, so this is Hogarth and his uh, east end. This is the sanctuary as we left it with the gilding. <coughs> the, 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 all the arguments about about decoration, obviously, taking the paint strips to find out uh, that uh, that Gibbs had uh, created with oil color that that sort of Portland stone color to the the East End, and that was the only place that there was gilding. So stripping it back in a way, um, and to create in the Nash Building the day. Center. Most importantly, the world of ablution, so that the homeless can uh, have a locker and can take. Uh, there was a complete shambles of sexes and youth and uh, you know age with the showers. The showers and the laundry are probably the most significant part of this. Um, but a vast number of covers uh, for people um, uh, during the day and night, and a doctor's surgery. Uh, this is the old uh, mortuary of Nash's building to take in the lead-lined coffins to his uh, his his um, his uh, vaulted um, uh, spaces for for those coffins, which didn't last that long. They they caused a, a incredible problems of leakage and uh, um, and ill health. So. Um, uh, and then uh, one forgets something incredibly important, this art room, which we culled out of a bit of, uh, of Nash, um, which when you think of it, you know, uh, as, a, as a homeless person, this is this, this, the process of making art of a canvas, or as many do, um, is really significant. It's the only place you have the security. You can create a world when you're getting kicked in a, a sleeping bag frozen on a street. So it's a very, very significant uh, sort of place. So the therapy of art, music is very important there. Um, and then creating, most importantly, the people who make it tick, who, who uh, day by day up in the attic um, uh, get the funds to keep the connection going because it doesn't happen in a, without a momentum. Uh, to do that, to send it back to, to its normality, we had to do this, which is it's a 24 million pound project. They had to do it in one phase, and they went, they signed a, a, a contract knowing that as, as a parish they still had to um, raise 12 million pounds. I mean, that moment when somebody says, okay, 
you're going to do it, is phenomenal. Um, another part of this delicate process of, of, of actually uh, contracting and doing. So uh, this is, the, the red uh, crane sits in the light well, which is 14 meters above the northern line. Um, and so this whole thing is being sunk. And, and because the building, the, the, the Gibbs building is simply settled on gravel, its retention is key, so the retention structure around it's like a sort of ship in dry dock. Um, but it, 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 the, the, the drama of building, of course, is in incredibly interesting as part of this process. And I think the thing you're not really uh, confronted with at architecture school is the simple problem, if you like, of, of persuasion. You know, the art of persuading somebody to go a bit further because it's difficult and under normal circumstances, you know, they won't sign a contract. So it's, it's, it's incredibly important. I'm, I'm not dwelling on the architecture hugely um, uh, today, but uh, this is the pavilion. There's seven tons of, uh, eight tons of, of stainless steel and glass that sits on the problem of what that pavilion would be. It started as a rectangular, uh, 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 a very square, um, uh, positive and negative of the light well, which gives light to that uh, subterranean world, and the positive, which would let people into this world. Um, I got, I had, I don't know, I had four meetings with Prince Charles, who kind of tended to hate it. Um, I was pushed in many directions in terms of geometry. I, you know, I couldn't do a circle because a circle is in my mind is, is the most sacred form. So I broke it, I made this, uh, this, uh, this kind of almost scar uh, um, uh, Scarborough-esque idea of the broken circle. Uh, I had to move away from uh, certain uh, constructional techniques because they just uh, wouldn't work. Um, but I wanted a building that had glass walls in a way because the, the wall, uh, like the crystal of glass, is a representation of the soul and casts no shadow. A very important sort of idea. So this is load-bearing glass, um, laminated with a little bit of ref reflectivity in it on, the, on a, a granite base. Um, and you carry this geometry with you as you go underground. The key to subterranean territories is that clarity and not getting lost. Um, uh, above, another part of that art uh, commission was uh, was getting Andrew Motion to write some stanzas for this uh, this uh, rail um, with a big drop on the other side. A very interesting meeting with uh, the 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 uh, vicar uh, Nick Holtham and Andrew Motion, which he said, "Well, I'll try." You know, he he had some reason from a memorial and a personal connection to do this, but he wrote this about the place and he said, uh, "Well, you need to give me a year. I may fail." Um, but, you know, it, it may get there. So, um, uh, another just part of the sort of ease, I have to say that Shirazé's window went backwards and forwards um, and was almost, almost lost um, because of kind of opposition. So, the persuasion to get that through, uh, incredibly important. And then to the third perspective, this is a sketch I did early on, just showing, you know, you have Gibbs, you have Nash, and then our uh, view, the third perspective from the subterranean um, and as it's built. Um, finally, many, uh, this is a little, sh a little chapel, really important uh, space uh, to the vicar, Dick Shepherd, who in the First World War opened up the crypt of St. Martin's as a place of sanctuary to soldiers going backwards and forwards to the, to the front. Um, it's kind of one-sided. It's underground. It's next to the um, next to the uh, light well, um, and for it, there has been a sort of gradual process of designing these benches. Um, uh, I always, even in that image, had the idea of a tapestry. Um, I didn't believe that it would be as beautiful as this. This Gerhard Richter that sits there, um, and he was interested because he'd seen Shirazé's uh, window and how wonderful that was. Um, and I designed this little altar, which is of a stone called Oviel, uh, which is the stone that the First World War monuments are made from. 
Um, as, uh, and because he had been a, a, a preacher on the front line and came back and kind of became a pacifist and so on, it felt apposite that it's not a hugely beautiful stone, but it's the right stone for the place. And I just wanted to compare geological time, as it were, uh, with historic time. And um, so this, as I went to the quarry, was open for me as a, a natural bed that revealed for the first time uh, life 150 million years ago, which I find incredibly moving and, you know, sort of part of the... It's like a, uh, it's like a keystone to um, a sarcophagus or uh, whatever. But uh, it's just, just that sort of uh, five years after the opening has just gone in, and these are just <coughs> the shots of where it is now with the east window. And you may remember that market shot and uh, the difference that um, uh, it, it has uh, come to be. This is early drawing to persuade people of the scale, and that's as built. And this, rather wonderfully, is a multi-denominational uh, blessing at the beginning of that process. So this is the Bishop of New York, um, and, uh, uh, and so it is. And then the consecration at the end. I mean, the English church is extraordinary in its kind of pomp and ceremony, and it does it very well. Um, so that's one uh, knuckle, which is a very kind of social, cultural knuckle of uh, Westminster. And uh, here I just come to um, an, another world, which is, you know, this world of, uh, of the Georgian grid um, of Westminster and um, the way in which something like this. So we're, we're going to look at a little site here, and we're going to look at a site just off Conduit Street. Um, so in Savile Row, so uh, you can probably see that better than me. It's just there. So the, this is like the crashing grids of estates, you know. It's sort of like geological intersections. Um, but what's, what's amazing is the way in which uh, the Hanoverian city sort of got established. This is St. George's Hanover Square. Handel's church for 25 years. Uh, the Rolling Stones had an office here, as I'll show you in a minute. And... Um, this is New Bond Street. So this is a street of extraordinary um, artifice in the city. Uh, and Savile Row clearly uh, as has had its, uh, its connection with fashion uh, for a long time. And it's now evolving um, from that to, um, to a world of, of art, obviously, as well. Um, so here is that, that sort of grid by night, uh, and I think that there's Regent Street, of course, so that's Nash, you know, Regent's Park. What a fantastic conception through Portland Place, Regent Street, round the back, Carlton Terrace, Trafalgar Square, an amazing piece of, um, of, of uh, negotiation, actually. And this is the Savile Row project, so um, it's a small part of that, but it's a part that was... Um, based on, um, I think this is a tiny sequence, if, uh, if it's going to work, I don't know if it is, uh, of film about Savile Row. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. But it's this question of the structure of the terrace um, as, am I stuck? No, they're good. Um, uh, of, of what makes that particular. It's the workshops below that are lit from the area and the street, the rising to the, um, to the shops uh, in which you get your fitting. <coughs> um, and this is, uh, this is a s the result of, of bombing during the war that opened up the connection between those two estates. It was l before that, it was a tiny little passage, like the passage to the Albany, which you may know at the other end. It's an amazing place. And this was then built out in the, um, in the second, uh, after the Second World War in the 50s as a, as a headquarters for a national um, power, um, national industry. So it was very hierarchical. It had a kind of entry. It had become English Heritage's head headquarters in London, so-called Fortress House. Um, it's an H plan, um, and it, it had a little little pavilion. Just you can't see it here, in which I remember being, uh, you know, kind of interrogated by English Heritage. I can put it no better than that. Over over another project, but I found myself in the midst of this struggle of, of, of legal and general who owned the site, who had developed it, uh, wishing to, to change it. You can, um, you can see uh, here it lies with its rusticated base. 
they were told that this, uh, this project, this value of the site as, as rebuilt was something in the order of uh, 40 million pounds. And um, when it was sold uh, last year, or late last year, it, it fetched 110, that's after the peak. So you see the sort of pressures that are, exist on this. Nobody quite knows what it's, its value is. And you start out and there's a pressure group saying, well, look, we could turn this into a hotel. Um, you know, and it might stack up or not. Um, but actually then they go to the market and they they're, 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 they're told informally that it's worth much more. It could be 60 million. They then uh, are told to, um, to, to go out to the market and I think, if from memory, it certainly uh, fetched 80 million. We had a change of uh, owner during this process, the planning process going on, the negotiation about English heritage moving out of the bulk and the mass um, and the condition of this as a big building. And the tailors are up in arms at that point, um, uh, just as you know, you have this pressure um, in Cork Street at the moment with, uh, with the Royal Academy um, and then the uh, gallerists and, um, and changes there. So there's this moving sort of sense of, um, of who goes where, which industry, what, um, what, what forces in terms of tradition and change are at stake. Um, I have to say to me, with the most amazing moment, probably around about here, I used to, I used to work for an engineer um, after leaving the AA, oh no, before coming here actually, and I, I scuttled along here to Times Drawing Office, and I could not imagine I could look one way to that and then the other to New Bond Street as an architect. At that point, nobody was building anything, so um, it's still a sort of mystery to me that this is, uh, this is, that the cycle has emerged in the way that allows us to contribute, perhaps. These were, um, these were alternative um, ideas for Elevations in stone, it was uh, going to be a stone building. I started with a ceramic building actually and I was told, uh, I, uh, this is a drawing I did to show two propositions. Compromise you may say, and, in, and indeed perhaps so. I wanted to work with a kind of weave of stone, uh, but I was prepared to look for the first time at horizontal courses, these string courses, and a, um, an idea of, uh, of punched windows into an elevation. Um, uh, so this is the way it emerged uh, with, um, for instance, a one point a residential section up on the top. Um, and a very, very a plan, you may say, is completely banal. It's, uh, it is a flexible plan. It's, I, you know, I often look at those Georgian streets, um, which apparently have a homogeneity, but have a fantastic difference behind. So Gower Street is a good example many others. Um, so it is, it is a, a skin that actually works incredibly hard tectonically to get no, there's no structure in here, right? It's all in the elevation. I'm squeezed by the developer from this side, I'm squeezed by the planner from the other side. It's how to create an architecture with shadow um, and at the same time a core that is really tight, allowing the next project to happen above. I had certain desires, I, I'm not um, dwelling on that particularly, this is, this is the way that facade works. I, and this is it complete, um, uh, compared with a very flat building, I always saw the, the animation of the base of the building very important. I saw the idea that each piece, this stone, that is a single, it's a three meter length of Portland stone, very difficult to get, but everybody was trying to to reduce the, uh, the, the very tight joint I wanted. Everyone was trying to persuade me by hook or by crook to, uh, to put joints in the lintels. Um, and those w that's one side of the story, to maintain those 130 lintels at three meters and get them uh, by charging down to Portland to accept that one, uh, uh, one group couldn't provide them but another one had the blocks uh, and there was absolutely no reason why they shouldn't take them uh, just because it was difficult, it was doable. So a lot of persuasion just in that. Sounds, sounds you know, <laughs> bizarre but true. The other was that I wanted an artist that so, um, the, the architecture is so constrained by planning in this respect. I needed the liberation of a sculptor. I knew I wanted to work with Joel. So uh, for six years I persuaded clients that he was the right guy, the planners, the art, the art 
uh, group at, at, at um, consultative group at Westminster now abandoned. It's a very interesting question about public art. Um, and this was after 9-11. Um, and it started with this kind of, that's a maquette in his New York studio of, uh, of dislocated pieces that come together then as a, a dancing figure, a falling figure, an ambiguous figure. The developers terrified this would become associated with that fall. <laughs> um, so we disguised it. We worked through polychromy, through finishes. There's a wonderful casting place. This is where sculpture just, sculpture sort of moves the architecture beyond its industrialized form. These are the sections of that piece being, being cast. There's another whole story in that. Um, but you see the saw marks of the very beautiful joinery from which it uh, cut, cut, cut uh, logging that it comes from. And here it is, two tons floating, uh, suspended by six cables, which sounds very simple, but it's actually, it's really a very beautiful act of engineering and uh, I, I believe of the of architecture working with, uh, with sculpture. Um, in a way, I can't afford to, to, uh, I can't afford to collect <laughs> significant work, but you can. Uh, you can be the enabler for uh, significant work to arrive in the public domain, which I find a really interesting uh, issue. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then I always intended that this would be a gallery, if possible, and to my delight, um, the base was, uh, in fact, I started the conversation with, about Joel Shapiro with his uh, gallerist, Tim Taylor. Um, and Tim knew he couldn't afford this, but Hauser and Wirth eventually did, so they moved in, and it becomes a kind of extraordinary focus around Hauser and Wirth. So um, uh, sometimes it's closed um, off, and it's this secret world. Sometimes it's opened up. As, uh, with this show, and you know, my struggle was with the frame and the glass, and an absorbent, anodized section between that and the picked granite that, um, you know, gives a certain scaling to the base of the building. Um, these are very big chunks of granite. You see that you can't do <coughs> six meters in granite, but I do a T and a section in the middle. Um, so that was Savile Row. And it leads to, and I will speed up, but by uh, negotiation, two projects, which in my mind are, are, are rise above architecture because they're about urban regeneration or urban making. Um, this is a wonderful site. So this is New Bond Street. This is St. George's Hanover Square, as I mentioned, uh, Handel's Church. Um, this is Maddox Street. Um, that as it gets built out, these are the original uh, Hanoverian townhouses, burnt out in the 70s, uh, really emasculated by a, a, a 70s building that has staircase and, and toilets in it at this point. Um, these are all a mix of, uh, of kind of uh, uh, law firms and bits and pieces, offices effectively in the, in the residential. Um, Max Clifford was sort of housed in this building, which is, was by very significant um, uh, kind of architect from the 60s. We come back to this is a listed building on the corner, Pinay, and you can see it like a kind of, uh, it's an unrequited center in a way. There is, uh, for those of you who stroll down New Bond Street, um, uh, this great fashion store here, then you get Phoenix and you get then you get, as with Hanover Square, the, the, the kind of land agents like Jones Lang LaSalle. Um, and our client was Scottish Widows, who owned quite a lot of this up to, up to this point, and they couldn't work out how to unlock this. They'd done a lousy project in the 80s. Um, and it's there for a project that's about just under 30 meters wide, 90 meters deep. It faces these very different uh, conditions. This is looking west down to Grosvenor Square. This is Mick Jagger's letter uh, to Andy Warhol about sticky fingers. <laughs> you can see uh, it's uh, 46A Maddox Street, our site. Um, and there it is, as it was. Uh, Michael Rosenauer was the architect. He had a fa very flamboyant uh, area here. I mean, Time Life, brilliant building. Um, you know, actually a hand in the Four Seasons up the road and other, other projects. He's uh, he's a very, very accomplished architect. Um, unfortunately, the building went, but it had already been completely bastardized. But 
this is what that 70s building, you know, it, it sticks out into the street, it, 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 it screws up the pavement, it reduces the view. I mean, the west view in the light is, is fantastic, and this is that lovely sequence of Maddox Street buildings. Um, this is our, the site as we have it, retained facade, we put back the panelling, worked out a kind of a use of these um, as, as rooms rather than open plan office. This is all returned to residential with small scale retail at the ground and there are two office buildings, one that works with the section of the Pin A building here on New Bond Street, the other one working with the, the section based on the Hanoverian houses. So they kind of don't join in the middle and that was what the, con the the, our client, Scottish Widows, wanted. They wanted to be able to sell them separately. Um, so this is it. You create retail with a 15-meter uh, span. You create an entrance to the office um, at this end, above the first floor. You have Pin A, the shoe shop here. You then have retail um, and uh, entrances to uh, accommodation above. As breathing space here, um, and, and then this gets really thin um, because in, when you're inside the block, the acoustics are fantastic, so you can open the windows, it's mixed mode. Outside, it's very, very aggressive, so it's kind of sealed, but it, these breathe to the inside of the, of the urban block. Very, very briefly then, tying up, as I say, with the, the, these uh, pre-existing <coughs> sectional orders, one to uh, St. George Street, one to New Bond Street, what was it to be? Pinne is a, a combination of faience, of granite. Um, it's extraordinary in its complexity, and it's extraordinary in terms of what it, what it holds. Um, and the process in my mind was to build a fa two facades. So there are two new facades that herald this, that one and that one. This one is, uh, is about artifice, and I was beginning to, to look at the issue of... Uh, of ceramic. This is a very early uh, study, actually when our, our facade on New Bond Street was wider, so I had a positive, uh, an A and a B, a kind of ordering, and these finials, which are reptilian perhaps. Um, and how are they made? They're made by this uh, group in Lancashire who's doing two things. They're producing a thousand Belfast sinks, and they are a week, and they do a lot of restoration work. And I, I kind of pride my relationship with them as one of being uh, the resuscitation of industry. I mean, this is something we, we have at our, at our hands, you, you know. Um, so these are the, the pieces laid, working through the glazes to get the depth of glaze. The, this, you can see, is a whole chunk of facade laid before it gets to site. This is it going in. It's kind of traditional, like masonry, but it's, uh, I, I would never float stone in this way, and it has this, uh, this character uh, of working with light. Um, this is it from the inside with those oriel windows, which you'll see I, I use once more in this, uh, in this lecture. This is the court with larch and as a, as a baffle and also a, a means of creating access uh, galleries so you don't have to have those hanging baskets to clean the windows. And this is the projecting piece where I cut away the end, uh, the bottom, in order to get the view of the street again, and it projects, and it's made, therefore, in, in metal, something that cantilevers easily, uh, in this dark metal with these uh, eyebrows and then uh, and these, and these uh, glass blocks. But um, at underneath it, working with an artist, so another artist, Anthony Malinowski, who many of you will know, this beautiful piece. He always wanted to do something in, uh, in, in, uh, in Venetian glass. So this is white gold ceramic uh, grid here. And then hand cut, each piece hand cut, this flow of color which works from east to west um, underneath this so that it's something that you pick up as you walk down the street. And finally, I, I know we're running a little late so I'll be very quick. Um, this project, which is, uh, is just now revealing itself, but is interesting because Nash is here again. Uh, Nash had a very small-scale kind of world for Regent Street, actually, um, relatively speaking. If you go to Portland Place, you, you see it um, at the top end with the quadrant. Uh, and then this thing is put on steroids by a bunch of architects in the, um, in the early 20th century, so the 20s. Uh, Norman Shaw, the hotels, um, Reginald Blomfield, his, his uh, acolytes, they had a really grand idea of, of this as being like uh, the Rue de Rivoli, this is Piccadilly, 
running down. Now, the thing that makes this work, I've, I've, I've talked about cost in several rows, um, and uh, is, um, is actually that leases, the Crown Estate, have, you will have noticed, you know, just uh, radically changed at spending half a billion pounds their estate on Regis Street. The only reason they could do that was that their, the leases that were 199 years, whatever, have fallen in, so they were able to take them back. And that is now happening with their estate in St. James's. And it's extraordinary what they own um, and what will happen by degrees. But the block we're involved with in is this. So it's the first block. This is Eros. It's the first block south of Piccadilly. And it's that half there with this quadrant used to put, because of the very sensible um, planning requirement in in Westminster that when you uh, enlarge uh, your uh, office capacity or the capacity of a site, you have to create residential and you have to create affordable, 50% uh, of that increase. So this I describe as like urban dentistry. I mean, this is a kind of decayed center of buildings that had lots of staircases with no capacity to, for ac access. <coughs> Um, a very crappy ground, um, you know, there was a sort of little hotel of 17 rooms that just could not survive, and then there was the world of German Street and the Hatters, and out of that, the th when you pricked this from planning for it, you realized that you were, you know, you were an innocent in a furnace, because the, uh, the, the, the Hatter hats every one of the good and the great, you know, there's a barber there they all go to, um, and, uh, and the hoteliers up in arms, and, um, and then there is uh, the planning, the conservation officer. Uh, these three buildings represent a period before the enlargement. Uh, there's a kind of block structure implied, which is not typical for London, but um, so this is as it was. You can see Blomfield and co. kind of come crashing around the corner uh, with the cornices. There's a sort of implied cornice. This is Waterhouse. Um, this does things that, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, uh, I, I are not exactly um, as as uh, as the book writes them, but uh, these two, three buildings, I said we would we would build a new facade here. And to make it work, I did a lot of urban studies, elevations and things. Um, this building, Barons, actually, I realized that Barons, these are some of the stories you hear. I only found this out the other day, but uh, 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 um, our friend uh, Sasha uh, uh, Baron Cohen, his father, the store is this, Barons. Bastardized. They really screwed this bit of facade. There's a beautiful cobble under here. It's not a great building, this, but it kind of talks to Waterhouse. And what we did was to take it down, store it off site, and bring it back, rebuild it six foot higher. So nobody heard that. But <laughs> and uh, because it predates the rest. And then to create a facade that would give us big retail, which is required up Piccadilly, an office entrance off Eagle's Eagle Place reinstate the smaller um, shop units in German Street and pull the whole block together. Um, this is my early sketch of what we're going to do. Um, and I had an idea that this would be ceramic and I wanted it to be artificial. It's like a, like a, a made up face. I, mean, I haven't talked about character or physiognomy, but it's incredibly <coughs> important in the city. Um, and uh, so I wanted to pick up the, the kind of history of, uh, of, of horizons that is so important here. It's a logia. There's, I wanted that to be an artwork, so I'm indicating to everyone, the planners included. <coughs> this was very controversial. The Crown came out of one meeting at Westminster saying it was like a meeting with the Taliban. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's not easy. I mean, it really is. Then, then there's a kind of, there's a desire by the, you know, committee that, and not the officers, that this should happen. So there's a pushing, and you're negotiating this world between the two. Um, and to do that, I said there had to be a really significant art piece here. I wanted it to be by a great po um, uh, polychromist. So I put a, a list of artists who I thought would work out of the body of the building in ceramic. Uh, I had Cy Twombly, I had Paul Huxley, I had Fiona Ray, I had Richard Deacon. 
And then I got the art critics, because they had nobody to tell them this is a good or bad proposal at the Crown. I got Richard Cork and Paul Morehouse um, to come to act uh, as part of uh, a distinguished panel to make the choice. And we made a great choice with Richard Deacon. Um, but at ground, you can see that the centre becomes uh, to do with uh, uh, circulation, uh, a tight core. Um, there's an entrance from this little place, Eagle, Eagle Place, to the office above. There's the big retail to Piccadilly, the small retail to German Street. There's a typical plan that can be broken up. It's a, a flexible plan. Uh, we'll see who goes in there. This is, I hate CGI's, but I'm just showing you this. Uh, I, the day of CGI is better than the end result. I shall resign. And, um, and it is, so it's kind of strong stuff because it is Piccadilly. It, but it, it shows, I, from that little sketch, I always wanted a blush within these double height elements that refer to the double height here. There's an attic. There's a sort of area above the big retail. Um, and uh, this is our working drawing for the ceramic facade, which is white, uh, uh, like a powdered face in a way. Um, it's, um, it just shows what's great about ceramic when it's cast is it can repeat. You have a mold. So you can get a lot of complexity in the section moving up through this, and you repeat it, and it becomes viable. Um, this is, the, I did a quarter scale model of it for the Biennale this year, and this is, w so that's the cornice as developed wonderfully by Richard Deacon, and this is his polychromy. This is, this is actual size in the, in the Biennale. Um, uh, this is just some of the, uh, the in some of the working drawings very quickly. Th it's made very strongly because you can't have a lot of movement in the facade if you're going to use ceramic, not in a kind of, uh, an extruded sense, um, as Renzo has it at St. Giles, but in, in a way that can be mortared and put together. Um, so this is the, uh, the, um, the blush. It started as an art project, hand-painted, but I realized once we had this going that this must become more architectural. So it uses a program um, and a, a, a pixelation so that it fades. Um, but this is his uh, corner sections. Um, this is the drawings we did to help the process. This is the dry lay in Lancashire of the cornice. So you would be down here looking up at this, or you will be. Um, and that's it. And I, it is actually sort of the, the, the scaffolding is being struck. And um, we'll see where it gets to. But I don't think the planners know what they've been dealing with. I don't think anyone knows what they've been dealing with. Um, it will be revealed at the end of February. At the moment, it's covered in a white um, film, so you can't see the polychromy. Um, because these things have, they have, uh, they must be like the triptychs that once arrived in in, uh, in Italian cities. You know, this three-day festival. This should be a festivity with its opening. So uh, that's something. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, you'd be happy to take a few questions. I think um, what you've presented to us is something that is, is sort of a, almost a, a forensic level <coughs> detail. And this detail of materiality, which is very interesting. And at the same time, uh, the bigger thinking of a restructuring of quite large elements in the city. So it's extraordinary sort of range of scales. And I, wondered just to start off um, a lot of the work you showed us is about collaborations with different people how much are you able to work through drawings and how much are you actually having to continuously think through the actual materiality and space and then come back to drawings so the drawings you show us are very precise and very elegant drawings and then you show us the extraordinary um, engineering work and complex sort of cutting and, and chopping and inserting that you have to do, much of which is extremely difficult to draw. So there seem to be so several different ways in which you approach how you will do the work. And I wondered to what extent, uh, given that this afternoon we were talk talking a lot about how the drawing is supposed to be able to be a way of thinking about 
project, how much you use the drawings as a way of thinking rather than just as working drawings to communicate? Mm. Uh, well, part of the process of negotiation is uh, is the material that you take to meetings to either uh, you know uh, a client or to the planners, mm. and um, <clears throat> I think if the dialogue exists, then um, I actually the honesty of something that's just happening, that's live, that's like a, a manuscript, uh, is 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 more persuasive than something that is um, a um, post rationalisation you like. Mm. So that the, these, I suppose, uh, you know, the, the process for each of these projects is probably, is a very intense one to planning, then there's a, probably a break while people uh, settle to the reality of having to undertake it, and then there's the process of, of making. Mm. And so we're talking about the same sort of time frame as making, I, I think, a kind of uh, a film. Mm. You know, it's a very much a team thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, a grouping of many uh, parts is, uh, I mean, uh, that's the other thing that people come to, always struck me, people come to architecture school expecting to be the architect. And if you go to film school, you, you might be, you know, approaching it from the point of view of the cameraman, of the, of the sound engineer, of the director, the producer. The, I think that's a better model. Mm. So the collaborative one is, is absolutely key. This is based out of a, out of a team. But at the end of the day, a, as we as architects are still responsible for a vision that is a strong enough skeleton mm. to withstand all the buffeting of value engineering or, um, or in the case of St. Martin Fields, it's still to me amazing that, um, uh, that if you go down, down to that light well, uh, there's a lot of space there underground. The reason it's there is simply that there's an architectural vision of positive and negative and you can't reduce one without destroying the other, so it exists. And those sort of strategies that are, are latent in what you put forward as a clarity to something are the things that are going to hold the project as it runs through. So I do find the, um, the, the act of drawing and mark making which you know, creates the skeleton as rough drawings and the party in old fashioned terms is absolutely mm -hmm. critical and that's a, the architect's skill hand and judgment. Um, and then with material, <coughs> um, particularly, well, you know, with stone, you can describe skiography, scale, joints that are incredibly important. Uh, but when you get ceramics, it's, it's, a, it's a much more difficult mm. process um, because it is an artificial material. Um, and the more artificial the material is, the more difficult the art of persuasion is in terms of how you represent it. Um, but I personally find it still very useful to draw it out. I have to draw at the same time one's making a rough uh, urban uh, kind of drawing, if you like, a very precise drawing. So all those drawings yeah. are drawings that are happening at a design stage where it's actually, you can't be persuasive unless you know, you only know if you've drawn. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's as simple as that. Really. Yeah. Well, it's not simple. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? I find very interesting actually is that uh, uh, St. Martin's is uh, an extraordinary conglomeration. Um, and I remember actually when the crypt was done, uh, you know, there was nothing done there. And then I think uh, J John Priceman and yeah. Mark did the kind of yeah. restaurant, and that yeah. encouraged a bit of use. Um, and then I think the other project is very interesting because y you said about the dentistry. I mean, you are sort of doing dentistry in a way because you're rebuilding this block into something mm -hmm. new which mm -hmm. has a sort of vitality to it. Mm -hmm. So it's reparative de dentistry, if you see mm -hmm. what I mean, sort of <laughs> in a sense. But one of the interesting things is, is um, you, every time you, you kind of sort of build into one of these blocks, you, you immediately open this can of worms of different interested parties and negotiations mm -hmm. to be made. So the projects are very particular that you showed today, that they're intertwined with the existing fabric. Mm -hmm. And uh, St. Martin's is interesting because it contains territory <coughs> around it too. So mm -hmm. it actually sort of expands into city space. Um, do you think, I mean, a lot of the projects we saw today in the presentations, they go to a much bigger size. I, you're dealing with the block and more. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that sort of attention to architecture it would be necessary if you go to a sort of bigger size, say, if you're doing four blocks? Or 
the well, whole of sort of Piccadilly Circus rather than <laughs> inside that own block because it's uh, yeah. it seems to me that in your case it's very important to have that yeah. detail because mm -hmm. how you insert is mm -hmm. part of the negotiation. Mm -hmm. In the urban diagram we see lots of things which are inserted without that mm -hmm. subtlety. Mm -hmm. and maybe that's one of the problems. Well, I, I think... Um, yeah, I think the w w what's uh, impl implicit in, in this is um, that it, there is a kind of mannerism which is about a responsiveness to the place. I hope I didn't probably make that as clear as I might. But, um, it, you know, Savile Row bears with it certain consequences. New Bond Street, um, Piccadilly Circus, certainly in my mind. Um, and actually, there is another project on just on running down Duke of York Street, which I haven't shown because of time but it's interesting to me to s stand back after these 10 years of work in Westminster or whatever to see what the intuition is uh, in terms of the, the characterization of a piece of uh, city fabric for a particular <coughs> place a context and um, I don't know the answer because I'm in the thick of it but my hunch is that um, that drawn out of this are different essays that are about the place that they they are responding to. Hence my um, word palimpsest in terms of you know conjuring um, for now for this this next kind of move, which will then be washed over in a different way in generations to come. Nonetheless, the response to a continuity with something that has been that tells you um, because not just of itself but the extraordinary complex sort of cultural and social history that exists that is changing and one's responding to and creates a future. That's what Westminster is about. I mean, it's so different to the city of London. So, um, you know, that's what's amazing about this city. So uh, what I find interesting uh, ultimately is it, it goes back to, to the sense, as I said, of streets and squares and um, the, the permanence, that's the permanence. We are kind of somewhere in between in terms of time. These buildings have 60 years, whatever. Um, uh, uh, or as a frame, longer. But it's, it's, you know, it's this sort of sense of working in a territory and responding to the territory rather than depositing a, a, a pre-conceived uh, um, object into into the landscape. So I'm being, I'm being talked to by, <laughs> by the, uh, the ghosts of the past, in a way, um, in responding. one more thing to that, which is, it seems to me very interesting, because I mean, I admire what you're, the way that you're filling in into the blocks and working with the blocks. But it's interesting within that context, because if you look at the Smithson's Economist building, and yeah. uh, you see the, <laughs> the plan that everything that was bombed would have this new typology place as a public space, which doesn't yeah. work, actually, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. It's quite interesting, the idea of actually beginning to, uh, let's say, convert the block, rather than necessarily mm -hmm. replacing it with mm -hmm. a new hierarchy of space that wasn't there before. And I think that makes a big difference, because the physical adaptation of the block, I think, is part of that equation rather than bringing in a new sort of a political stance to the block? Well, I think I started with Savile Row as a competition, uh, thinking about fragmenting the block uh, with homage to the Smithsons. And I, you know, because I love that building, I've taken students to it, taken gone through it. Um, but it is interesting that, that to make a new piece, I see this as kind of an interesting issue, to make a new piece of public territory in a city is takes the kind of guts, you know, of a Nash or a big idea. It's very monumental. Um, I, you know, to uh, restrain yourself to to working within the constraints of something um, uh, that is forced by economy or whatever. Because I'm talking about very ordinary buildings here, in a way. I'm not talking about monuments. Um, not not St. Uh, St. Martin Fields is another issue, but the the other ones are about a kind of order, or urban reordering of the everyday of the city, you know, retail, office, working space, living space. And I find that mix just incredibly compelling, but not big enough on its own to start to make the kind of gestures probably now that the Smithsons made um, of the separation, because as soon as you separate, you monumentalize, you know, you particularize. And, and whilst that is a fantastic um, uh, intervention to uh, when one's on the on the board, one's always sort of uh, 
kind of, uh, maybe there's an instinct that says you've got to change it, you've got to make it, you know, you've got to break down that street, you've got to make a space, you've got to, <laughs> um, you know, to, to be seen. Um, but actually the art of just, uh, of characterizing facade, elevation, just working away at elevation, seems to me one that's passed by uh, in the big gesture. So that's what's another underlying where you've got ordinary stuff is to work with it but not to lose the strangeness of the place and what you can draw out of it as a kind of spirit. So, um, you know, it's, that seems to me a challenge enough in a way. If you think of uh, what a, a, a portraitist gets out of a face with a twist of shadow, <laughs> you know, I, it seems to me that elevations have this extraordinary depth that we don't generally challenge enough um, in, in probably as architects. Another question? Battered them into submission. <laughs> no other points to raise with Eric? Okay. Well, we'll wrap it up. It's been a very long day for us in uh, housing and urbanism, uh, and we've been very lucky to have Eric and a range of other critics discussing the uh, final work of the MH programme. And it's a great pleasure to have Eric back in the AA talking about his projects, which I think, again, they, they reinforce to us the value of architectural thinking that is so often lost in the making of the city, that if you fight as hard as Eric fights, you can actually persuade investors, you can persuade planning authorities and other people to go that little bit further. It doesn't really cost them any more money in the end, but what you leave as a mark on the city is infinitely more important and, and, and rich and valuable. And that's something which we, they seem to understand in the 19th century. You, know, you look at some of those grand buildings which are sometimes over the top. Yeah, postscript is that actually the that planners are our allies, however difficult they are. <laughs> they are the people who make the game difficult, uh, without which we yeah. would have no platform to persuade clients, you know, I mean, developer clients. Some planners are our allies. So it is, it is, I think it's a very important yeah. point. Well, thank you very much, Eric.